Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar um, from the East Sussex Eye Group. So the webinar, as, as usual, being recorded, and I will put it on our YouTube channel, the Sussex Eye Group, in the, a couple of weeks' time. There is one CET, CPD point available for tonight, and that's if you've registered and logged in. Um, you need to be on for at least 50 minutes um, of the webinar for the CPD point. And if I could just, um, well, House Rule mentioned, when you register, can you please make sure your details are correct, your full name, and more importantly, that your GOC number is on there, because there's a few that haven't got correct GOC numbers. And when I produce a certificate, it will put on whatever you've typed in there. So if you haven't got your GOC number, your certificate won't be correct. Um, and this CPD point is available for optometrists and dispensing opticians, as if you're watching it live uh, as it's being recorded. The lecture will run for about 45 minutes with about 15 minutes at the end for questions. So at the bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A box. If you have any questions um, throughout the webinar, please type them in there. And at the end of the webinar, I will then pose these to our, our speaker. So I'd like to welcome tonight's speaker, Mr. Sharon Kashani. He's an ophthalmic consultant surgeon at East Sussex NHS Healthcare Trust, specialising in the management of complex medical retina disorders. He performs intravitreal anti-VEGF injections and steroid implants, anterior and posterior segment laser treatments, as well as high volume cataract surgeries. He, was previously, he has previously been the clinical lead for East Sussex NHS Trust and is now the head of retinal services and uveitis. So tonight he will present a webinar to us on diabetic retinopathy. Thank you very much, Mr. Charney. I'll pass over to you now. Thank you, Ian. Uh, so let me want to share my screen. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you very much for um, rejoining the talk, as it were. Um, actually, let me just see if I want to get my present view. Uh, insert. I should have done that before. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm sorry I had to cancel last time um, as I had um, laryngitis and completely lost my voice. So you wouldn't have heard anything during the talk, which some of you may argue was, was a good thing. Um, uh, Ian, can I just confirm, can you, see, can you see everything on the screen? I can see it, but your slides are a bit small. There's a row of slides at the bottom and then- two Oh, I see, okay, up. okay, okay, I see. So it's doing that, okay, is that better? That's better, yeah. Yeah, that's okay, fine. You're literally sharing my screen. Okay, fine. So uh, anyway, um, thank you very much for, for coming back. I hope that uh, the lecture lives up to expectation and you're all good. So I'm gonna try and finish this um, within an hour with the q and I, I know Ian's very keen to go and watch Love Island at nine o'clock and he told me strictly that I need to finish uh, by uh, 8.59, so he doesn't miss a, a moment of it. So I'll, I'll try and keep on time. So today's talk is about diabetic eye disease. Um, I've previously shared my financial interest and um, various ways that you could get in touch with me via email, website, um, Twitter, Instagram. Um, what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to mention what diabetes is, how it affects individuals and the healthcare system, different ways diabetes can present within the eye, and I'm not just talking about retinal disease, um, history, examination, and investigation in a patient with diabetic retinopathy. We're going to concentrate really on management of diabetic macroedema and preventive diabetic retinopathy. And then um, I'm just going to mention, I'm not covering diabetic retinopathy screening service. This will be something that we will uh, do as part of our um, series of talks uh, of how diabetic retinopathy screening service works. and what they do and et cetera. But this particular talk won't be covering that. So I'm sure a lot of you know what diabetes is. It's generally a group of diseases that's characterized by high levels of blood sugar. And that's as a result of defects in insulin production or actually the action of the insulin. Um, and this chronic uh, hyperglycemia, um, which occurs kind of causes damage to various end organs in the body, including the brain, the heart, the eye, um, blood vessels, limbs, et cetera. And we'll go through some of that as we, as we progress through the talk. And the effect of diabetes is long-term. So normally 
patients with diabetes can be diagnosed through uh, se several means. The characteristic symptoms are thirst, going to uh, urinate very frequently, blurring of vision and weight loss. But in some severe cases, um, you can have this very, what we call a hyperosmolar state where the blood sugars are so high that the patient can actually be comatose and very unwell and sometimes even death. So most of the time that you tend to see kind of the catastrophic effects uh, of diabetes presenting in that way in type one diabetes. In type two diabetes, often patients are not aware that they have a problem, but as time goes by, um, the symptoms kind of build up and as the blood sugar goes up, they start getting these, what we call hyperosmolar symptoms, where, where you start getting thirsty and you have polyuria and um, brain vision, et cetera. So the, most of you would have heard of, even myself really, uh, before the talk, just the top three uh, causes of diabetes. Uh, and uh, so types of diabetes, which is type one diabetes, type two, and gestational diabetes, which will happen during uh, pregnancy. But there are other types of diabetes, which I've mentioned here, and that's kind of slightly out of uh, the scope of this talk, um, as we are kind of trying to keep it ophthalmic. Secondary diabetes uh, uh, is caused as a result of some other medical uh, problem. For example, if you are, um, if a patient has been put on steroids and the steroid has so drug induced or steroid induced diabetes mellitus, or you know you've got conditions like Wilson disease due to uh, copper overload, etc., which damage liver and um, other organs causing diabetes. So, or hemat hemochromatosis. So, so those are kind of like secondary diabetes, but the effect is the same. Essentially, you have high levels of blood sugar, which causes damage. And in type one diabetes, the body's immune system uh, is actually damaging the beta cells in the pancreas, which produce the insulin. And you tend to see this in children or young adults, often the um, kind of the body shape and uh, uh, the presentation is very different to type two diabetes, as I said, mainly children and uh, you know young uh, adults with low uh, BMI that tend to get type one. And sometimes it can happen after a viral infection or after some sort of immune condition. That kind of type one diabetes affects uh, about five to 10%. Uh, case of patients with diabetes. Um, type 2 accounts for 90 to 95% uh, of patients with diabetes and actually it tends to happen in older patients who maybe have higher body mass index, have family history of diabetes, um, there are genetic and ethnic uh, factors that are involved with that as well and it's more type in type 2 it's not so much that you have damage to uh, pancreatic cells which produce insulin, there is insulin. In fact, in some cases, there is more insulin than the body needs, but the insulin doesn't work. And the cells become resistant to insulin. So that's type two diabetes. And gestational diabetes, uh, as the name suggests, is type of glucose intolerance uh, that develops in women during pregnancy. And it can affect five to 10% of pregnancies. So actually, uh, so the, and the other thing to say that if you do develop this gestational diabetes, the risk of you getting full-blown diabetes after birth is 20 to 50%, so quite significant. Now, it is quite common. So worldwide, uh, we have 415 million adults with diabetes, and kind of this picture shows where kind of really high uh, prevalence of diabetes is. If this was a geography test, I would ask you where the dark blues are, I think, if I'm not wrong, I think that that's Saudi Arabia, and I think this one is Egypt, but you can, you can, I'm sure, tell me if I've got that completely wrong. But anyway, um, if you think one in 11 adults in the world have diabetes, which is an astronomical number, and from that 415 million people who have diabetes, 93 million have eye damage, so that's one in three. So uh, if you're a medical retina specialist like me, you're not going to be out of the job anytime soon. Diabetes rates are going up and um, we know that it affects one in three um, patients living with diabetes. And, the, and, the, and a lot of people just think or obsess over control of diabetes. In fact, that's just one of the things that is important. We have shown that control of high blood pressure, control of cholesterol, uh, uh, control of your kidney function, pregnancy, um, and um, control of your diabetic uh, control, uh, obviously your HbA1c, all those things uh, affect how badly your eye gets damaged. 
So, you know, you can't do anything about being diabetic. The longer you live and the longer you live with diabetes, the higher risk of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic related eye damage. But it is just as important to control your blood pressure and cholesterol. That's where a lot of diabetic patients are actually on treatment uh, for, uh, for um, controlling the blood pressure and cholesterol. And often the treatment criteria for managing those medical factors is often lower uh, threshold than if it's in somebody who doesn't have diabetes. So that's an important thing to home into patients. And it can, of course, affect uh, a person in different ways. So it can, you, you know, it can impact, obviously, your vision, which can cause problems with your physical well-being, psychological, your ability to go to work, drive, and loss of independence. So effect of diabetes on vision um, is extremely important as it can affect people in lots of different ways. Um, in this particular um, kind of uh, table, we've mentioned various things that are more likely to occur in patients with diabetes. So um, you can see that they're at risk of stroke, diabetic retinopathy, neuropathy, angina, uh, kidney disease, amputation, retinopathy. So the retinopathy affects uh, about 0.5 when it comes to uh, the questionnaire that was done across large number of patients with diabetes. So, uh, but a lot of you know, stroke and neuropathy were kind of higher up there as well. So still quite important when it comes to um, how diabetes affects the quality of life. Now, moving on to how um, diabetes actually affects the eye, and I'm kind of going from front to the back. So um, lids, lashes, and conjunctiva. So there's increased incidence of styes, nephritis, and conjunctivitis if you're diabetic and you're more likely to have colonization with bacteria such as Staph aureus or Staph epidermidis in patients with diabetes. So um, in that way, diabetics can have, um, it can affect the, the eyelids. Uh, within the cornea, you can um, have decreased sensitivity uh, within the cornea and more risk of developing uh, neurotrophic ulcers, um, especially, uh, and difficulty tolerating contact lenses. So. Diabetics tend to have increased incidence of bacterial keratitis, especially when it's not controlled, and more problems with contact lenses. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Now, primary open angle glaucoma is interesting because there is some uh, talk about how um, diabetes could be correlated with glaucoma. Uh, but at the moment, the consensus is that there's no definite link between being diabetic and developing glaucoma. So, so far, styes in lids and development of corneal ulcers uh, in the cornea as a result of being diabetic. Now, I had a patient with this actually today in clinic. So she came in, she uh, kept saying that she'd been to her optician and she wasn't happy with the glasses that she was given. Uh, but she also then mentioned that in the last six months, her diabetes has been really poorly controlled. She'd been admitted to hospital with infection. And of course, that really pushes the blood sugars up. And um, when you've got fluctuating blood sugars, uh, patients uh, can have symptoms of blurring vision and change in refraction. So in particular, uh, when the blood sugars are high, there is more aqueous fluid diffusing into the lens, causing more of a myopic shift. And conversely, when the blood sugar come back, it goes back the other way. So it's important that in your phakic patients um, who come back to you um, who are diabetic and come back to you complaining whether you've given them the right prescription or not, it's important to check what the diabetic control is. Because if they tell you that the blood sugars are, are fluctuating like crazy, then that's one thing to consider before you start um, doubting yourself or even uh, kind of thinking that you might have given them the wrong uh, prescription. Um, and in general, diabetics are two to four times more likely to develop cataracts. So kind of, you all know that mainly it's for serious subcapsular uh, cataract, but actually cortical cataracts uh, can occur um, in um, diabetics. And that's as a result of glycos glycosylation of the lens protein. So that's an example of a cortical cataract, which you can kind of see uh, affecting this patient. And this is a picture of a posterior subcapsular cataract growing at the back. So moving on, ciliary body, um, this kind of really reflects to the change of the lens in order to accommodate any diabetics. Um, there is increased glucose in aqueous deposit in the ciliary body and reducing the 
ability for the ciliary body to work. And so diabetics tend to have presbyopia at an earlier age than non-diabetics. So probably the age range group that might affect this tend to be the younger age group. So maybe you'd see this more in your type ones because a lot of the type two patients who get diabetes at an older age are presbyopic already. Uh, I'm sure you know that diabetes is a risk factor for retinal vein occlusion. So moving back to retina now. And um, one of the things that we always get asked about with respect to investigations in vein occlusion is that uh, if the patient is over uh, 50, we only do full blood count, uh, ESR, HbA1c, which checks for diabetes and a 24 hour blood pressure. That's all you need to do if your patient is over um, uh, 50 years old. Under 50, or if, the or if retinal vein occlusion occurs in both eyes, then you do need to start investigating them, looking at other things uh, like clotting screen, et cetera. But that's kind of more retinal vein occlusion talk rather than uh, diabetic retinopathy talk. So main thing is that if you see a patient with retinal vein occlusion, do ask them whether they have diabetes. Optic nerve, so diabetic papillopathy, don't see it that often actually, uh, but it, it definitely uh, is well described. And this is kind of more uh, to do with acute disc edema uh, that typically occurs um, in patients with uh, diabetes. And when you're looking at the eye and the disc looks solid, normally um, the vision is around um, 6, 12 or 6, 15 or better. And it's probably actually a reversible form of a non-anterior non ischemic optic neuropathy. So you might get visual field defects with this and that the visual field defects could include increased blind spot, arcuate scotoma, or even altitudinal scotomas. But in a lot of patients, the vision improves and the visual, visual fields tend to uh, uh, get better. And one of the ways of um, essentially trying to uh, diagnose it is using fluorescein angiography and you'll see leakage on this, but it can be very difficult to differentiate diabetic papillopathy from uh, somebody who has uh, non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, and, and obviously if they are diabetic, that, that differentiation is, is difficult. Uh, but in kind of diabetic papillopathy, about half patients have it in both eyes, whereas non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy tends to occur in one eye majority rather than uh, both, uh, unless they're very unlucky, and you tend to see the papillopathy more in type 1 patients. In fact, 7 out of 10 patients have type 1 with this. So good prognosis, vision tends to be 6, 12 or better, resolves over a few months, and there is generally a good recovery as a result of that. And these are some examples of patients with this acute uh, disc edema that you see in diabetic papillopathy. So remember, type 1 mainly um, seven out of 10, it tends to be quite acute. Uh, vision loss, despite the kind of quite uh, amazing appearance or quite uh, striking feature of how swollen the disc is, the vision tends to only be mildly reduced and it tends to improve over um, kind of few months. Um, and the visual fields defects can be various things, but they tend to improve with time. Um, actually, so uh, diabetes is also separately a risk factor for non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Now, this is different to diabetic papillopathy. So sudden onset tends to be non-progressive. The vision tends to be really poor, unlike diabetic uh, papillopathy. There is often a relative afferent pupillary defect. You may not get that with your diabetic papillopathy, especially if it's in both eyes. Uh, it tends to affect color vision. Uh, significantly, and you tend to get these altitudinal um, visual field defects. So these are vis visual field defects, which are unilateral, as NAION tends to be in one eye, and tends to kind of respect the horizontal meridian in that eye. Um, but it does occur more in diabetics and non-diabetics, often this optic atrophy, and the defect is normally fixed. So quite, quite different, really, compared to uh, diabetic um, um, diabetics are also at risk of nerve palsy. So this could affect your six, your third, your fourth, your sixth. And generally, um, they've shown that the sixth cranial nerve, um, which involves your lateral rectus, so 
abduction tends to be affected most, followed by third nerve palsy, where you tend to have ptosis with the eye looking down and out. And then the fourth, where you have a hyperopia uh, or vertical double vision. The um, main thing with diabetes or patients who have diabetic um, eye disease and then develop a third nerve palsy is that they um, tend to, it tends to be pupil sparing. So unlike a, a compressive lesion, which actually um, presses on the third nerve, uh, which involves the pupil or can involve the pupil. Um, in diabetes, it doesn't tend to. Now, pupil involvement doesn't mean that it's 100% compressive or vice versa. It just gives you a great clue. So I would panic a lot more about a third nerve palsy if the pupil was involved. And you would have to then worry that, that this patient is in neurosurgical emergency, basically. Um, I would still panic about a patient who has a third nerve palsy and the pupil is not involved because, um, you know, that doesn't mean it's not compressive, but it's just more likely not to be. So um, what tends to happen is that when they get that ischemic insult from diabetes, it tends to cause a bit of demyelination. And actually, most diabetics or most ischemic cranial nerve palsies tend to improve over a few months. And in fact, if you see a patient we tend to scan most of them, to be honest, um, unless there is very good reason not to. But another reason for scanning, if you haven't scanned them initially, is that if they don't recover, then within three or four months, then you need to scan to see why and whether it's definitely ischemic or not. But I would say they pretty much all get um, neuroimaging when they come with like a third or a sixth nerve palsy. So diabetes makes them develop them more likely. We kind of mentioned that you get bacterial keratitis in cornea. Well, diabetics tend to have um, higher risk of infection after surgery. So whether it's trabeclectomy, cataract surgery, intravitreal injections, you're more likely to develop endophthalmitis as a result of um, diabetes. So that's something important to learn. And also, you know, generally diabetes tend to affect wound healing. Now, we get, or I get asked quite a lot of questions with, um, our staff who come to me and say, look, you know, this patient is very poorly controlled diabetic, but they're due to have cataract surgery. What do you think? And I think if they've generally started off being diabetic, so it's, if it's newly diagnosed, there's no need to rush with the cataract. It's better to get the diabetes controlled as much as we can before we plan cataract surgery. But look, if they've had diabetes for 10, 15 years, it's not been good for the last three, four years. They can't actually see the insulin syringe in order to sort their diabetes out, then in that case, you just have to uh, proceed because if you don't improve the vision, you're not going to improve the quality of life and you're not going to uh, get them to see better. And really this becomes a bit less important. So it's important to differentiate those two very difficult scenarios. Now, the majority of my talk is going to be on retina so, uh, because that's what we all kind of see and read when it comes to diabetic eye disease. So with diabetic retinopathy, symptoms, as you can imagine, with most conditions that affect the macula uh, include blurred vision. Um, now the blurring of vision, distortion, all this is to do with development of macular edema, uh, or more importantly, fluid within the fovea, which kind of uh, pushes the photoreceptors apart or together and changes the orientation of the photoreceptors to, towards the way they receive light. And once you change that anatomy, you're going to start developing symptoms. So as the fluid increases and you're elongating these photoreceptors, they can snap and you can kind of cause damage, uh, permanent damage to the back of the eye. So it's important to pick up uh, the, on these symptoms. Um, fluctuating vision, um, majority are asymptomatic as you, know from diabetic retinopathy screening service, most of the patients who come to us are not aware that something's happening in the back of the eye. Macular edema is interesting because if you have macular edema uh, or fluid as a result of wet AMD, often patients are very symptomatic. And that's maybe because you've got blood vessels that are growing from the choroid into the retina, damaging RP, damaging photoreceptors. Often there's a lot of damage that's, a, a, that's occurring in wet AMD that you may not see um, for example, in diabetic macroedema, because in diabetic macroedema, the fluid leaks very slowly into that space. And although they can become symptomatic, often you're surprised with the fact that the vision is pretty good despite presence of a lot of edema. So, you know, um, it's important to treat diabetic macroedema, but 
probably not as urgent as what you tend to see, say, with wet AMD. And vein occlusions are kind of somewhere in between, you know, that catastrophic blockage of a vein that causes damage to photoreceptors, shearing them off, iron toxicity from blood hanging around, etc. That tends to kind of be um, kind of more intermediate when it comes to tolerance of fluid when we're treating patients between wet AMD and dilated retinopathy. So in wet AMD, we treat pretty much all activity, all fluid. In diabetic macroedema, we tend to be a little bit more selective and I'll, and I'll come to explain that to you in a minute. And as I mentioned to you within the history, so it's important to ask them how long they've been diabetic, what the control is like in particular, you ask them about the HbA1c, are they on the regular follow-up with the GP or a diabetic specialist? Most of them are like uh, managing the community with the uh, uh, nurse um, specialist. Um, are they type one? Are they type two? Is there any coexisting disease, which I mentioned to you, like hypertension, cholesterol, kidney disease, pregnancy, anything like that? Any previous treatment? That's important. So have they had laser injections before? And very importantly, are they part of the screening service? You know, diabetics don't only have eye problems. They, they get checked for neuropathy, for kidney disease, for um, you know, all sorts of things. So it's important that they are in the system and are having regular uh, diabetic checks with their GPs. And you play a, a role in identifying that if they are not. Um, I've mentioned eye pain here. Uh, so, you know, the distortion and the vi blurred vision is kind of quite obvious, but the eye pain tends to occur in patients with neovascular glaucoma, that's advanced diabetic retinopathy, which we'll come to in a minute. So when it comes to investigations within the eye clinic, we do what you do essentially in the uh, primary care settings, we do vision, we definitely do an OCT dilated fundus exam to look at the back of the eye. Uh, fluorescent angiography is actually probably one of the few, diabetes is actually one of the few investigations investigations where fluorescent angiography is quite useful because OCT or even OCT angiography, uh, which is dialysis um, uh, method of looking at blood vessels in the, in the macula, they don't pick up what's happening in the periphery. So when we organize fluorescent angiography, we do in diabetics always ask for peripheral pictures. And that's because you can have these very peripheral new blood vessels that are affecting the back of the eye. And that can, uh, that's quite important to know, especially if you haven't picked it up on clinical examination. So wide field for angiography is quite important in diabetics. And often, you know, uh, it gives you an idea of how ischemic the eye is and, um, you know, whether you need to start treating the perforative diabetic retinopathy or not. So uh, within our setting, I suppose the only extra thing we have that you may not have in, in the primary care setting is the fluorescent angiography. So damage generally occurs as a result of leakage of fluid. So you can see that you've got a normal blood vessel there in the macula um, and within, within retina, kind of the main trunks of blood vessels are laying in front of the, uh, on top of the, um, you know, nerve, nerve fiber layer. And then the blood vessels kind of go into the retina and they lie somewhere in the middle of the retina, which is why uh, when the capillaries leak, the leakage in diabetic retinopathy tends to be intraretinal within the retina. You can get subretinal fluid or what we call fovea detachment in diabetic retinopathy as well, but mainly is intraretinal fluid. Whereas with wet, AM, wet AMD, you tend to have a lot more subretinal fluid because of where the blood vessels are going via the choroid. So um, as the blood vessels become leaky, you can get fluid that's leaking out you can get um, cholesterol deposits in form of exudates uh, that, uh, that grow out. And these are kind of all the things that you're used to seeing with uh, diabetic retinopathy. And we'll go into more of that in a, in a minute. And this kind of confusing picture here just tells you that when the blood sugars are up, you get um, excitement and all these kind of cytokines and uh, growth factors upregulate uh, within the eye, which then actually cause a lot of damage. And one of the big upregulators is vascular endothelial growth factor, which actually promotes formation of new vessels and leakage of blood vessels. And that's what the injections do. They block the signal that causes the blood vessels to get more leaky or um, kind of uh, abnormal blood vessels developing. So uh, the traditional method of kind of um, talking about diabetic retinopathy has always kind of been look background, pre-perifative, perifative, and advanced. So with background, um, 
like over here, you've got kind of microaneurysms, and microaneurysms are just dilated capillaries. So, so remember in this picture, I mentioned to you, you've got the blood vessel on top, and then they go in, and then right in the middle of the retina, you get this capillary network where gas, you know, gas exchange occurs and nutrient exchange occurs. And if you get dilation of the capillary there, that's what a microaneurysm is. And normally capillaries are, are too small for you to see with uh, kind of your lens. So when they're dilated, you can just see as a red spot. And then a dot and blot hemorrhage happens is when a capillary bursts. So when a capillary bursts, the blood kind of <clears throat> flows out, but because it's in the middle of the retina, the photoreceptors and the kind of other uh, uh, cell lines within the retina kind of push it all together and you get like this round hemorrhage or dot and blot hemorrhage that we see in the back of the eye. And then hard exudates, which are kind of like the, lim the um, uh, lipid exudates uh, that occur in the back of the eye. And as the ischemia progresses, as the diabetes progresses, you start getting changes in the blood vessels. So what we call venous changes. So if you look at the, uh, the retinal veins, you can get dilation of retinal veins. You can get what we call sausaging um, of the retinal veins. You can get uh, reduplication. I've got pictures of that coming up uh, of veins. So you get changes in the, in, in the venous system. And another thing is uh, IRMA, which is intraretinal microangiopathy. And these are basically blood vessels. These are kind of collateral channels. So these are channels that develop between the arteries and the veins. They're not new vessels, but when you start seeing IRMA, then there's significant um, ischemia in the back of the eye. And sometimes it's very difficult to know whether something is an IRMA or something is a new vessel. So the main thing with IRMA is, is that they go between arteries and the veins. And of course, then you have the perifative disease, and that is when things are really bad. So you've got abnormal blood vessels developing in the back of the eye, and then you know that the eye is in trouble. And normally, you know, they develop on the disc, which is very significant, or they can develop around the retina. And the ones kind of that develop around the retina can be quite difficult to see. Sometimes I've looked and I thought, oh, you know, severe non perifative retinopathy, you do angiogram and you've missed a couple of spots of the um, new vessels. So they can be quite tricky to see. But new vessels on the disc is not, and it's quite easy to see, and it's very important never to miss that. And then in the advanced form, you can get new vessels on the iris uh, or in the um, uh, angle, and the pressure can go up. So uh, diabetic with high pressure, make sure you have seen uh, the angle and the iris to make sure that, you know, they haven't got new, uh, new vascular glaucoma. There's another way of, which I quite like, of looking at diabetic retinopathy if you don't like the background pre -perifative, perifative, Um And it is, I think it's generally quite important to learn different methods uh, of grading. It's don't, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't just kind of learn one way of doing it or, or the other. It's good to be aware of both. But I generally use this method, which is essentially the four to one uh, rule, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so with four to one rule, you're essentially <clears throat> dividing the retinopathy between non-perifative and perifative. And within non-perifative, you have mild, moderate, or severe. And perifative is kind of quite simple. So perifative means you've got new vessels on the disc or elsewhere. Uh, and now I'm going to explain how you define mild, moderate, and severe. So the four to one rule, I'll come to this in a minute. Uh, okay, so I've come back to it here. So within the four to one rule, what we are, what essentially we are saying is that something is mild if you've only got, so you, so, so you look at the quadrants, okay, of the retina, so there's four quadrants. So you've got <clears throat> your superior nasal, superior temporal, infratemporal, infranasal. So if you've only got microaneurysms, that's just mild non perifative diabetic retinopathy. So if it's only MAs, mild non perifative if you have got the, the, if, if, if the retina has the problems with the four to one, which is essentially hemorrhages in four quadrants and or, so it doesn't have to be all of it, hemorrhages in four quadrants, venous changes in two quadrants or irma in one quadrant, then it becomes severe non perifative So if you've got a patient, I mean, you know, if you've got irma in one quadrant, you're gonna have the other things as well anyway. But say if you've got, 
um, hemorrhage is in three quadrants and irma in one, then it's severe and operative. You don't have to have venous changes or, or anything like that. So, so it's four quadrants of hemorrhages and slash or two uh, quadrants of um, uh, venous changes and or one quadrant of irma. And that, that becomes severe. Anything that is that doesn't obey the four to one rule, uh, but has more than microorganisms, then becomes moderate. Let me explain before I uh, kind of confuse you. So, so this patient, for example, has only got a microaneurysm. So that becomes a mild non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. If you've only got, so within the four to one rule, is they have got diabetic retinopathy, but it's mild and it's non proliferative. Um, and 5% of non proliferative diabetic retinopathies can become proliferative diabetic retinopathy in 12 months. So that's quite scary, really. I mean, I know it's not huge, but you know, to go from mild to proliferative is quite, quite important. And that's why kind of they are seen at this point <clears throat> every 12 months under the diabetic retinopathy screening service. And the things that are going to make them do that is if they are extremely uncontrolled when it comes to their diabetes. Now, this one uh, is, I think, on, is, have I got that as severe? I can't move this. Uh, right. So yeah, so this one I've marked as severe. So we're going from mild to severe. So within severe, you've got four quadrants of hemorrhages. So if you actually look, this patient has hemorrhages in all the quadrants. Um, venous changes in two. Now, because they've got hemorrhages in four, you don't have to have the venous changes. But actually, if you look quite carefully, here you can see what we call sausaging of the veins. They become like almost segmented. And you've got it here and there. So they've got kind of two quadrants of that already. The four would have been enough, but you've got the two as well. And I can't see an error here. So this uh, you know, classifies as severe non proliferative because there's no new vessels, but they've got all the other features. Now, compared to mild, 52% of severe non proliferative progress to proliferative diabetic retinopathy within a year. And that, that's why these patients are not followed up in diabetic screening service. So diabetic screening service only follows up, follows up patients with uh, mild non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Everything else gets uh, kind of pushed to hospitalized service. And they screen, you know, 20,000 patients, <clears throat> 22,000 patients in East Sussex every year. So we get so many referrals uh, for diabetes and non diabetic uh, referrals from the DRSS. So that drives a lot of our workload. Um, but at this point, with a severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you wouldn't treat the patient unless there was presence of macular edema. I'm going to come back to macular edema. And this kind of patient, I will review every three to four months and strongly advise them that they need to <clears throat> make sure that all the medical parameters are, are kind of uh, followed up. Now, this patient um, has got moderate non proliferative diabetes homopathy because they don't, they've got more than microaneurysms, but they don't have four quadrants <clears throat> of hemorrhages or two quadrants of venous changes. In fact, there are no venous changes here, really. There are probably hemorrhages in about two quadrants uh, in this patient. Um, and, you know, the fact that they've got macro edema or not is irrelevant. So when you're kind of talking about diabetic retinopathy, you're going to grade the retinopathy first, and then you're going to mention whether there is macro edema or not. So you'd say proliferative diabetic retinopathy with macro edema or with no macro edema or you know, non profitive mild non profitive uh, diabetic retinopathy with macular edema. So this patient has got loads and loads of exudation <clears throat> within the macular area, and there's almost certainly going to be macular edema here. So I, I'm going to, as I said, talk to you about that in a minute. We can treat the macular edema if, uh, it's, if, if it's indicated, but otherwise for the retinopathy, if they didn't have macular edema, it's six to eight monthly in the eye department. Now, this is kind of when diabetes goes really bad. So here you can see uh, right and left of a patient who's had loads and loads of laser burns. And the aim of laser treatment is to treat proliferative diabetic retinopathy because once you've got these abnormal blood vessels grow, you need to kill off the <clears throat> stimulus of abnormal blood vessels. And that's by killing off the photoreceptors. And that's what laser does. So you laser the retina. And of course, what it does or what this does is that you damage the visual field and it becomes an issue for driving, et cetera. So this patient, yes, may now not develop any new vessels and you've managed it, but they will have very constricted visual fields. And there is actually a growing 
uh, role for using anti-VEGF therapy. At the moment, that's not NICE approved. Uh, so um, it's only available privately. But if you have a patient who, for example, wants to preserve the visual field and doesn't want to have panretinal photocoagulation for the PRP, anti-VEGF may be an option for them. I personally think you need to choose your patients carefully. I don't think, <clears throat> say, a young patient who's got really bad new vessel disease can be managed with anti-VEGF alone for four years because once anti-VEGF goes off, then the blood vessels can develop. So it kind of depends on them as, at the same time. But I think that you, you could probably use anti-VEGF as an adjunct. So if you've given them enough laser, but you know, the laser is not quite enough, but they're still able to drive because of that. And you're worried that if you give any more laser, it might affect them. Anti-VEGF might be quite useful for that. Or you could give them gentle laser with you know, two or three injections of anti to get the blood vessels go, refluorate them and see how you go. So it's kind of a bit of a, I think the role of injection is more adjunctive rather than pure for treatment of the blood vessels. Now, if they've got macroedema, then even better because actually that's what the injections really were for to treat the macroedema in diabetes. But, you know, it does as byproduct treat the, um, the blood vessels as well. And this is what we don't want to see, where you've got fibrosis of the blood vessels and you've got what, you know, tractional retinal detachment and things like that that's developing. So you definitely don't want that to happen. Now, with um, macular, so I said I was going to mention to you, <clears throat> so we didn't really mention, so we kind of mentioned how you grade the retina. With macular, there is kind of different ways of looking at this, and this is where some confusion occurs. So pre OCT, uh, we used to decide if somebody have uh, macular edema based on clinical examination. Hence why CSMO was coined clinically significant macular edema. That's very different to diabetic macular edema, which is now picked up using wonderful OCT. So the OCT is 20 times better in picking up macular edema than even the most experienced eye surgeon looking with a 78 D lens at the back of the eye. So the OCT just picks it up much more quickly. And that kind of then makes you think, should we treat or not? But in the olden days, what they used to do is to look with a 78 lens. And if the patient had retinal thickening associated with exudates within 500 microns of the fovea, then that counted as clinical segment macroedema. What did that mean? It meant that it was a macroedema that you would need to treat. And as there were no injections, you would fluorescein them. And if the fluorescein showed where you could laser, you would laser the macula to get rid of the macroedema. Another uh, kind of indication was if you had uh, an area which was as big as a disc diameter kind of affecting the fovea <clears throat> within a disc diameter, that would be CSME as well. So. Sorry, I'm just talking quite a lot. Uh, so um, that so those kind of are indications of CSME. So CSME essentially means laser treatment. But now we actually know laser doesn't work well when you've got these pictures. So when the macular edema affects the very central part of the macula, actually laser can't really help or do that much. Um, and injections are what you need. So this is kind of quite a complex thing of, uh, that I have uh, on how you divide macular edema. So, and it's kind of just, we could have a whole lecture on it. And I'm not going to bore you with it. But essentially, when you look at macular edema in a diabetic, you think, is it, does it involve the center? Does it not involve the center? If the center, i.e. the fovea, is not involved, is it clinically significant? So you look with, this, with your uh, 78D and decide whether it's within 500 microns or not. If it is not, and they are not sym symptomatic, that you can observe it. Um, if it is clinically significant and they are, again, don't have any symptoms, you can discuss observing it. Or if you think the vision is down or they're symptomatic, you can organize fluorescent angiography and possible laser treatment. So that's if it's not involving the center. If it involves the center, you're kind of talking more about injections. And <clears throat> at the moment, we are restricted within NICE guidance where we can only inject them on the NHS if the center of them fovea, i.e. The, the kind of the central circle, is more than 400 microns. So if the center is less than 400 microns, they don't get NHS treatment at the moment, which is a shame. And that's because of the way 
nice rations, basically, uh, treatment. So they, they essentially picked this study, which had divided patients into three different groups. Surprise, surprise, the group with more than 400 microns benefited most from anti therapy, and they used that trial to <clears throat> then tell us what NHS could provide to the patient. So anyway, hopefully one day we could lift that and treat all patients with it. But essentially, if the center is involved, um, it's much more likely that they need injections. Now, I'm not saying that laser doesn't have a role in that, um, in that kind of patient. So you can try anti-VEGF therapy, and if the fluid keeps coming back or it doesn't go away, you can then fluoresce and then see if there are any microaneurysms that you can pick with laser treatment to, in order to kind of avoid the fluid coming back. But the mainstay of treatment for center involving diabetic macroedema is injections. Um, and this is a very good reason why we should look at injections. So these are kind of a couple of graphs at the bottom here. You can actually see that these patients have had laser treatment, whereas the other ones have had anti-VEGF therapy. And this is decrease in uh, retinal thickness, which with laser treatment happens much more slowly. This is like over a year. Um, and so the kind of sitting with chronic fluid in the back of the eye for some time, whereas with anti-VEGF therapy, after the first injection, you know, after four weeks, massive drop in uh, macroedema, which then is maintained over two years uh, um, with continuous therapy. And changes in vision the same, much more rapid increase in changes in ETRS letters uh, with anti-VEGF therapy uh, as opposed to um, patients who have laser treatment. So laser does play a role, but <clears throat> you know, you've got to think where the fluid is coming from and, and whether that's what you want. And this is the kind of picture you tend to see with laser. You, know, you get these kind of uh, laser burns in, in the macula, which can cause scotoma because you're damaging the photoreceptors you're trying to protect. And that's why it's very important to have done a fluorescent angiography before you do a macular laser. Uh, whereas with anti-VEGF, you don't get any scarring, but of course there's that cumulative risk of an infection if you keep injecting them. Now with diabetic macular edema, your patients tend to uh, probably need about 10 to 12 injections over three years. And then, you know, you've pretty much cured them off uh, that uh, diabetic macular edema. So a lot easier to treat. Uh, than with MD, probably because, you know, the anti-VEGF goes in the vitreous and only has to go to mid-retina to kind of uh, start working on what it needs to work on, whereas with wet MD, the blood vessels are coming deeper in and it's more difficult to get into. And <clears throat> these are examples of the new vessels that you can see, so clearly very obviously here you can see it on the disc, and these are new vessels that you see in the peripheral retina. Now, with new vessel disease, at the moment, the way I work things is that if they've got new vessels, I'll discuss uh, retinal laser uh, PRP because you don't know when you're next, next going to get them into patients. We're quite behind with follow-ups. And what you don't want to do is to have somebody who has what I call low-risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy going away and coming back with high risk. So if they've got changes in within the retina, I would... Uh, probably talk about um, treatment, and you mentioned in particular uh, visual field defect and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so if it's high risk, definitely you need to treat PRP, and that's if they've got abnormal blood vessels on the disc greater than a third or any NVD, so even if it's less than a third of the disc, but there is pre-retinal hemorrhage, then you treat that as well, or any new vessels elsewhere associated with vitreous hemorrhage. Um, now, anything else apart from that is low risk. So in theory, you could watch low risk, but you need to see them every month. Now, no eye department can afford to bring these patients back every month. So we kind of discuss laser earlier with these patients. And laser treatment is often done over several sessions as one of the side effects of PRP is that you can get macular edema. So when you do do PRP, we tend to uh, laser them kind of over two or three sessions and then just see how they get on. So side effects of uh, panorate of coagulation then, macular edema, as I mentioned, loss of peripheral vision, <clears throat> issues with driving if both eyes have been done. Um, Foveal burn, hopefully we don't see, but you know, it's quite easy to, if you're not kind of careful that one of the laser kind of just goes astray, hopefully that's, that's very rare. Um, as you're lasering the retina, you can get, you know, because you're lasering the photoreceptors, you can get uh, problems with the RPE and blood vessels can grow. So you can get secondary uh, choroidal neovascular membrane growing in. 
<clears throat> and sometimes you can get retinal tears, vitreous hemorrhage, uh, or retinal detachment as a result of PRP. So this actually um, is a picture of a patient who I treated. Um, he didn't want to have um, laser treatment because he had had some laser treatment already, but he was still able to drive. So this is the left eye, and you can see the laser marks here in that left eye, okay? So this was... So essentially you get these abnormal blood vessels at the junction of non-perfusion and perfusion. So when you look at fluorescing angiography, what you wanna see is gray, the black areas, which are seen here, okay? Or up here, are what we call capillary non-perfusion, i.e. when the fluorescent is going in, it's going to the main blood vessels, but then because the capillaries are all closed off in peripheral retina uh, here, uh, the fluorescent is not going through them. So they appear as black areas. And where you've got the junction between <clears throat> kind of, perfusion and non-perfusion, so gray versus black, that's where the abnormal blood vessels grow. And here you can see that this chap has got loads and loads of abnormal blood vessels, so he needs much more laser treatment. So instead he had two or three anti-VEGF injections and you can see all of the abnormal blood vessels are gone. So, so then you would say, well, you know, surely they come back. So yeah, so you're going to wait and see how long it takes before they come back. If they come back like, after four weeks or you know, really aggressively, then you've got to tell the patient, look, you know, you might need more laser treatment realistically to manage this, but if they, it takes a few more months and you might get away with two or three injections there to just keep these at bay, then that might be an option in order to preserve them driving. And I think this is kind of like what you don't want to see. So advanced diabetic retinopathy causing neovascular glaucoma with abnormal blood vessels affecting the iris, and you can get these blood vessels can contract and you can get tractional retinal detachment. And at this point, it becomes an absolute nightmare to treat these patients because they need to have surgery. They need to relieve the traction. They can get more retinal detachment. At this point, the, the, you know, this macula is really ischemic. So you really need to get to them before they get to this point. New vascular glaucoma is the second commonest cause of evisceration um, after um, uh, malignancy. So it's very important to try and manage the patient before they get to that point. So final thoughts then, um, as I mentioned, <clears throat> trying to think of this holistically uh, with any diabetic patient that attends fully dilate, always look at the back of the eye, always look at the retina, think about all the different things that you can do, not just the retina, but all the other things we mentioned. Um, when you're referring patients, it's quite nice for, for us to know really what other medical problems they have, how good the diabetic control is. If you're grading retinopathy, choose either, I said, don't put all your eggs in one basket, choose, choose, know both system and then see what works for you. As I said, I prefer the four to one rule because I think <clears throat> it's a much nicer way of doing it. You don't have to do that, but essentially, you know, we went through it and, you know, you kind of know what you're looking for. And as I said, the four to one only applies to grading the retinopathy not whether there's macular edema or not, that's something on top. And with the macular edema, now you all have OCT. So you can do OCT if there's macular edema, you mentioned uh, macular edema, if there's a macular edema, there isn't. Um, kind of the OCT has slightly put the whole concept of clinically significant macular edema a bit to the side, because if you know you can see it on the OCT, then that kind of biases you when you look at the back of the eyes. But that's kind of something that we deal with all the time. Um, and um, yeah, OCT macular for sure. And always, always be worried in a patient with diabetic who has eye pain or the pressures are high or they can't with floaters because that's like when they could have turned perfect. Now, I still, I think have five minutes, maybe even more. If there are questions, need to make sure Ian gets to his love island. So I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shah. That was really interesting, as always. So we have got a few questions, if I could pose those to you before you need to dash off. Um, I had a patient saying they've got type 3 diabetes. What's that? That just oh, no, that's, a, that's a good question to ask a diabetologist. I, to be honest, I don't know. I know there's like the other... So you know that slide I show you, which is type 1, type 2. So type 1 is insulin not being kind of attacked to pancreatic cells. Type two is when there's insulin resistance. Then you've got gestational. And then there were some other ones, late onset, so called LADA, and then there were other ones. So it might be referring to kind of to those, but don't take my word for it. I, I'm not sure what type three diabetes is. Sorry. Which is hereditary, type one or type two? 
I think there are genetic factors in both. So you can affect both. So both type one and type two can have genetic influences. Type one is kind of a lot more autoimmune. <clears throat> so, you know, you could see how hereditary factors could affect uh, an autoimmune condition, for example, or we see it often after a bad viral infection. Uh, type two, uh, you know, genes play an important part with that. So that goes with insulin resistance, obesity, uh, you know, all kind of glucose intolerance and all those kind of things. So they both have genetic influences within them. Uh, but I would imagine that type two has more genetic uh, influence than type one. Lovely, thank you. Um, any clinical perils regarding distinguishing between arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and non-arthritic anterior ischemic optic? Uh, yeah, so I think the main thing is pain, actually. So if you've got a patient who has arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, then they tend to have eye pain. They will have GCA <laughs> symptoms. So if you think about uh, temporal headache, uh, proximal myopathy, so muscle pain, because often GCA goes along, is a continuation of polymyalgia rheumatica where they get proximal myopathy, so shoulder pain and hip pain. So often patients can't stand up or raise their hands above the shoulder. <clears throat> so, um, so proximal myopathy, um, headache, jaw claudication is very important in uh, patients who have arthritis. And, um, you know, uh, and non-constitutional symptoms like weight loss, fever, uh, things like that. Within the eye itself, arteritic optic neuropathy tends to cause kind of white chalky um, disc. So when the disc is infarcted, it's really white and chalky and you can get cut and wool spot around the disc. Uh, whereas in non-arteritic, they tend to wake up without any pain. They often wake up and realize that they can't see out of the eye. And that's because they've had these kind of nocturnal dips in blood pressure. Um, <clears throat> where you've got the ischemic effect and then you've got the swollen disc. But pain is the main thing. And then appearance of the disc tends to be, you know, you tend to maybe get more cotton wool spotty things or white chalky disc in arteritic versus non-arteritic. But, you know, I would imagine, uh, you know, running an inflammatory market and asking about pain or GCA symptoms would be the main thing. Lovely, thank you. Um, the next one, should we be referring patients with macular edema after a routine site test, if the patient is already under the medical retina care? So, no, I don't think so. So I think that's a very good question. So if you've picked up macular, if they're already on the medical retina care, then I don't think they need to be referred in. So it all depends on, on what. So if they're already part of say the injection service and they're having regular scans and injections, then absolutely not, you're, you're fine to go ahead. Just probably be very guarded in informing them that um, obviously when it comes to subjective testing, there might be an issue in them being able to give you a true answer if there's significant macular edema in the back of the eye. But as I said, with some of these patients, you know, they've had 20, 30, 40 injections, that fluid is never going to go away. So you might as well try and update the glasses as much as they can. And the patient has to understand that there's a risk that you might not be able to give them the best possible one because their retina is not perfect. But um, what I probably wouldn't do is to, uh, you know, uh, prescribe glasses to a diabetic patient who's got macroedema and has not been diagnosed and has not been assessed to have treatment because, you know, they might need injection and that might alter things, especially if they're faking. You've got to make sure that the diabetes is well controlled because they might be having kind of myopic shifts and things like that. So, so I think ask them whether they are part of us. And then, uh, if, you th if they say that they're not having injections, not having regular scans, and they're seen once a year, or are unaware that they've ever been told they've got fluid, uh, then I think at that point, you could, you could send a referral in and say, look, you know, we found macular edema, uh, do you want to see the patient? And we can always check Medisoft and decide whether the patient needs to be, to be coming in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do DRSS do OCT as well as fundus images? Yes, so that's part. So I'm going to do a whole talk on DRSS at some point, or maybe Cash will. One of us will, um, and I think uh, so. So this will be covered in, under that remit. But essentially, what DRSS do is they grade the retinopathy, and once they've graded the retinopathy, they decide if there's macular edema or not. So macular edema is graded not based on OCTing every patient, but it is graded based on what they see. On the, on the picture. So if they've got a microaneurysm where the vision is 612 or worse, or if they've got exudate, 
any exudate within one disc diameter. So the whole definition of macul maculopathy is very different to what we have what we have clinically because they they have to they have a much broader kind of definition of maculopathy otherwise they might miss things so so if they see exudate within quite a large space within the macula they will mark it as m1 or a maculopathy and that will instigate a referral to hospital eye service but because we were getting quite a lot of m1s um uh, we decided the, the screening service now does oct on all the m1s themselves and we look at those scans and decide which ones need to come in and which ones don't. And more often than not, the ones that have been graded as M1 have no fluid at all. So it might be tiny amount of exudate, but no fluid. So those can remain in what we call OCT surveillance within diabetic retinopathy service, where they're seen every three months, scanned, and we will look to see whether that needs to review. If there is fluid, however, we will then ask the patient to come to hospital service, and then we will decide. Is the fluid central or not central? If it's central, is it more than 400? If it's less than 400, what are the options? If it's not central, do they need laser treatment, et cetera? So, so the quick answer is yes, they do the OCT. If the OCT is negative, they will carry on doing OCT every three months. If the OCT is positive, then we will see them in the hospitalized service if we think we can do something about it. Is it possible to reverse type two diabetes? Again, probably better for a diabetologist, but uh, the short answer, the last I know, is that yes. So there was this kind of um, program, I think they were calling it the Newcastle diet. And that, I don't mean your Newcastle diet, Ian, because I know what that involves, but uh, I, I was aware, again, please don't quote me on this because I'm not a medical diabetologist, but essentially the patients were given a very restricted diet of 600 calories, with, which caused massive weight loss. And a lot of the patients actually, um, what happened with a lot of the patients went from being clinically diabetic to not clinically diabetic. And then once they kind of stopped that, some of them reverted back, but not all of them. So some were able to reverse their diabetes. And then another way of doing, I think another, other patients that have managed to come off the diabetic, the diabetic medication is if they've had pancreatic transplants and things like that. Um, again, don't quote me on it, but I think there are other ways of uh, kind of, you know, managing, managing the situation. But, but yes, in theory, you can, yes. Perfect. And um, there is a request. Um, could you please show a retinal photo of Irma again, if possible? Probably haven't got time for that, but I wonder if you'd be able to post a picture on the WhatsApp chat. Yeah, I will. I'll what, sorry? Um, I'm just going back to the question. Um, could you post a, a retinal photo of an Irma again, if possible? Yes, I will probably look for a good one and send it to you because I don't think any of the ones that I have had a good one, but I'll, I'll post a good picture of Irma. So again, within diabetic screening service, when we grade these patients, because uh, often anything that's more than, um, uh, kind of if they need referring to the hospital, we have to regrade them. Uh, we have a function where we can essentially uh, kind of black out what well, was red free. So you can see the Irma's quite clearly. So what I will do, is I will go and look at one of the past images of Irma, take a picture of it, and then put it on the WhatsApp group. Lovely, thank you. And then someone's posted a comment, read Michael Mosley's book. I don't know who he is, if you've heard of him. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure who's, sorry, I can't see the chat, but Michael Mosley. Michael sure. Mosley. Not read it, but maybe I'll, I'll look it up and read it. Lovely. Well, that's all the questions. So thank you very much, Sha. I know you want to dash off to watch uh, Love Island. So um, thank you very much for everybody. For <laughs> Me watching Love Island. <laughs> uh, Ian, <laughs> I know you've got the whole series. In fact, aren't you going for it next year? If I'll Sarah allows you. <laughs> I'll try and get the CPD uh, certificates out this weekend and the video to go on the YouTube channel. Somebody asked earlier if it's going to be on the YouTube channel. And yes, once I've edited it and put it together. So it might be this weekend, might be um, uh, a week or so. But I will post all the videos out. Um, so, oh, there you go. Somebody's answered that question. He's a TV doctor uh, who was diabetic and reversed it. Ah, I think Artifed actually uh, mentioned it and then Paul has mentioned it. Okay, so actually that's good. Michael Morley, Morley's book. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Adafa and Paul. We'll be looking at that for sure. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. So I'm going to end Thanks, now. guys. Well, uh, let you know when the next webinar will be. Yeah. And I'm sorted today. Take care. Thanks, Sean. Bye. 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 Bye.